The Australian band Jet sprouted up in the early 2000s and was lumped in with groups like The Strokes, The Vines, and The White Stripes as part of what journalists dubbed Garage Rock Revival or The New Rock Revolution. Side note guys, I've done a whole video on The Vines, the link is down below. Jet's debut album Get Born, which came out in late 2003, while a massive success, sputtered out of the gates and almost didn't even make much of a splash. Today let's take a look at whatever happened to the band Jet. Jet's beginning started in 2001 with guitarist and vocalist Nick and his drumming brother Chris Sester, who were working for their family business, a spice factory in a suburb of Melbourne, Australia. Nick would work in the warehouse while his younger brother would do deliveries. It was after they got off work that the brothers, along with schoolmate guitarist Cameron Muncy and bassist Doug Armstrong, who would eventually be replaced by Mark Wilson just before the band broke, would commandeer an office in their parents' factory and write songs, as well as plan out their next move. The band's name would come from the Paul McCartney song, with Nick telling the Sydney Morning Herald, We were always ambitious, but our ambitions were very realistic. We need to blow people's minds with this next song we write. Before the band started writing their own material, they did perform some gigs around the Melbourne club circuit, playing cover tunes from their favorite bands including ACDC, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, The Who, The Kings, and Oasis. Nick would tell the Sydney Morning Herald, We started when Chris wasn't even old enough to get into a pub. Chris was 16 and playing drums and we were doing shows then, but we realized we were shit and our songs were shit. So we thought, well, F that. The only people that would come were five mates of ours that could be F driving to the city to watch you play. So we thought, let's get good at what we do before we show anyone. One of those gigs resulted in the band being paid in just three beers. The only problem was that there were four band members. The members of Jet did get good and soon enough they were selling out shows on the competitive Melbourne club circuit. They would get their first manager and they booked a UK tour in late 2001, resulting in the band getting press coverage in the British music magazine Enemy. In November of 2002, the band put out their first EP, Dirty Sweet, whose title would be inspired by a lyric from the glam band T-Rex. The EP would consist of four songs, including their future hit Cold Hard Bitch, and the New Musical Express, who reviewed it, showered it with praise. Of course, it didn't take too long for record labels to notice, and there was soon a bidding war to sign the band. Nick would tell rock journalist Tommy Danger in 2003, there was a lot of interest, so we were able to say, we only want to sign if we're making decisions. The band would end up signing with American label Elektra, who gave them a lot of creative freedom and would fly them out to California to begin work on their major label debut, Get Born. The name of the album would be inspired by the Bob Dylan song Subterranean Homesick Blues. The majority of the album was already written during those early sessions dating back to 2001. The record would contain three big singles, including the Faces influenced ballad Look What You've Done, Are You Gonna Be My Girl, and Cold Hard Bitch. The band and their label had high hopes for their record when it was released in September of 2003, but it initially only charted in the upper echelons of the album charts in America. Nick would tell a city newspaper, there was such a big expectation and we just thought since we have the support of an enormous American record company who pumped all this money into it, they wouldn't allow it to do anything but go well. I remember everyone was a little surprised that it didn't take off as quick, but it didn't take that long. It would be one decision the band made that turned their fortunes around. Jet would allow tech company Apple to license their song, Are You Gonna Be My Girl, for one of their commercials to promote their new product, the iPod. It was after appearing in the commercial that the album took off. The band almost passed on the commercial with Nick telling the Morning Call newspaper, our video was brilliant. It was new and we were sort of like a bit confused. And then this iPod thing came we were a bit skeptical. We were like, uh, an advertisement, what? And the money wasn't even there. It wasn't really paying us anything. But I think they had a sort of inkling about how big it was going to be. And in a way, one of the clinchers was that their ad looked sort of like our video. It was really strange, everything lining up like that. The band soon nabbed opening spots for Kings of Leon and impressively the Rolling Stones. In March of 2004, Billboard magazine would write an article interviewing several radio programmers in America who agreed that Jet had the best prospects of any new bands for a long career. One radio programmer from WZZN in Alabama would tell the magazine, we're having the most success with Jet because they sound like ACDC. The band also found some fans and more established rock artists with Steve Van Zandt playing the band on his radio show. It was following the release of the band's debut record that Jet would be lumped in with the likes of the White Stripes, the Hives, the Vines, and the Strokes, who were hailed as the next generation of rock or the saviors of rock. Anyone remember that Rolling Stone cover with the Vines hailing them as the saviors of rock? They certainly had egg on their face afterwards. 
So what did Jet think of the label and their competition? Nick would tell the Washington Post, I don't feel it's so much of a competition at all. We're just trying to focus on the lost art of writing good rock and roll songs. We've always just sort of kept our heads down during this garage rock explosion or whatever the F the press wants to call it. A lot of these bands, they've got the haircuts right, the right style, they're hanging with supermodels, and they're busy being the hottest new thing. Well, we didn't want to be that kind of band. We want to make five records. We want to be successful. Despite not feeling like a lot of competition, Jet did see one big difference between themselves and their American counterparts with Nick telling the LA Times. There's a lack of pretentiousness about the country referring to Australia. We always come across as a bit refreshing, even in person when we met the label for the first time, and we're talking to some of the people involved in the industry. It really helps that we don't have our heads up our ass. Despite all the band's success, they weren't really loved by critics, who slammed them for being derivative of the Stones and the Faces. Their big hit song, Are You Gonna Be My Girl, was also criticized for sounding too similar to Iggy Pop's Lust for Life and Screwdriver by the White Stripes. The band long denied they were inspired by either song, instead pointing to the song I'm Ready for Love by Martha and the Vandellas and You Can't Hurry Love by the Supremes. At the end of the day, the band's debut album was a huge success, selling over 3.5 million copies. But it was during the band's time on the road opening for Kings of Leon that the Sester brother's father would pass away. It hit the brothers particularly hard with Nick telling the LA Times, I didn't care about anything anymore. I went to some pretty dark places, disappeared off the face of the earth for a while. Nobody even knew where I was. I didn't even want to be in the band. Jet would end up regrouping, releasing their sophomore record Shine On in 2006. That was a departure from their last album with more reflective and slower songs, with the title track paying tribute to the Sester's late father. Nick would tell the LA Times, it ended up being an incredible experience. We came back from a wretched place, dealt with our demons and our grief, and wrote some really special songs. The process was really cathartic. The band would even have a song named Fallen Star on the soundtrack for Spider-Man 3, which came out in 2007. The group's second album was a modest success, but didn't match the sales record of their last album. The band would follow that up with their third and final release, 2010's Shaka Rock. The album would prove to be the worst charting of their career in America, peaking at just number 27, but it still went platinum in their home country of Australia. The band having reached their breaking point soon called it quits the same year. It was following the band's final gig in 2010 that Jet frontman Nick Sester would leave the stage, telling Rolling Stone, literally 48 hours after that last show I was in the middle of the Jordanian desert with a Bedouin guide and a bunch of camels. I stayed there for months, me and my wife in a four wheel drive. That's where I was physically, mentally, and emotionally. Within three years of their formation, the band was selling millions of copies of their debut record in both Europe and Asia. But critical backlash, drugs, and poor commercial performance of their second and third albums prematurely ended the band's first run. Nick would tell Rolling Stone, I think the problems in Jet were a combination of a few things. The relationship between us were all awful, we were all tired, and we were drinking too much and taking a lot of drugs and making bad choices. We went through all the cliches. We very much became a cliche of ourselves in the end. I guess that's why for me, the answer was to completely walk away and rebuild from the ground up. In the years since breaking up, the band was still inundated with offers, but Nick was the odd man out, not wanting to revisit his old band. In the aftermath of the band's breakup, Nick would study languages in Germany and Italy, while also working on his first record. His brother, Chris, meanwhile, would produce other bands in LA. However, by 2016, the band would reunite with Nick telling Rolling Stone, it's mostly curiosity at this point. I'm open-minded and curious and hopeful. I really want this just to be fun. The band would open dates for Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band in 2017, and they soon hit the road in 2018 to celebrate the 15th anniversary of their debut record. Jet will play their last show in 2019 with Nick Sester opting to continue his solo career. In 2021, when asked about a reunion, he would tell an interviewer, Personally, I have no real desire or ambitions at this moment, but who knows in 5-10 years how I'll feel. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again in Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.